Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the International Maritime Organization's celebration of World Maritime Day 2020 and its theme, Sustainable Shipping for a Sustainable Planet. We're very happy that you could be here for this virtual celebration. I have one program note before we begin, and that is we will have a question and answer period at the conclusion of this session. And we would uh, like it very much for you to participate. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A box on your screen. If you hover on the screen, you will see a, a box with a question. You can type your questions and then they will be passed on by me to the panelists and uh, we can get answers. Uh, and with that, we'd like to begin the program. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, Mr. Kitak Lim, for opening remarks. Mr. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> moderator, ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this online event on World Maritime Day 2020. When we decided the theme for this year, sustainable shipping for a sustainable planet, we had yet to imagine a world changed and challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the maritime sector, there is an unprecedented humanitarian and safety crisis impacting seafarers. Hundreds of thousands of seafarers remain trapped on ships and others are unable to join ships due to travel restriction imposed because of the pandemic. We must and will continue to work with all stakeholders to resolve these issues. Designating seafarers as key workers is the key. Nonetheless, throughout this pandemic, shipping has continued to deliver vital goods. Shipping carries more than 80% of global trade and is still the most reliable efficient and cost-effective method of international transportation. Shipping and maritime will be at the heart of the economic recovery, both at the sea and ashore. The maritime sector has the potential to support an inclusive and resilient economy to underpin the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 goals. Sustainable shipping for a sustainable planet is as relevant as ever as we all seek ways to build a better post-COVID world. Attainment of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals at last will be facilitated by shipping, but our industry must also do its part. Sustainable shipping means that shipping activities must be balanced with the safety of life at the sea, the long-term health and diversity of oceans, and that shipping has to contribute to the better against climate change. To ensure supply chain function safely and effectively, digitalization and automation are vital. Since April last year, it has been mandatory under IMO's facilitation convention for ships and ports to exchange arrival and departure data electronically. Data standardization and harmonization support the smooth flow of a trade, increase the data collection, processing, and interconnectivity capability will support sustainable shipping. Automation in shipping has the potential to enhance safety, to improve environmental performance, and to enable more cost-effective sustainable shipping. A sustainable planet will also depend on a shipping industry that is well-trained, inclusive, 
and diverse. The humanitarian aspect of a crew change crisis have shown that the goal of ensuring decent work for all extend to shipping. We must continue to attract the best talent. A sustainable planet will depend on every sector's efforts to address environmental issues. I am will continue to push forward to consider new regulations and to implement and achieve the ambitions in IMO's initial strategy on reduction of a GHG emission from ships because the battle against the global warming and the climate change is still our biggest challenge. New technologies, new fuels and innovation will be vital. IMO is pushing ahead with ambitious global project to support all countries to implement already adopted IMO measure and to support innovation and the pilot studies on reducing GHG emission. No one should be left behind. We are working to develop a new project to support the member state to achieve sustainable shipping and to protect planet, in particular the marine environment. These include ongoing global projects to tackle marine plastics litters and to address the spread of invasive aquatic species through biofouling. Per the project are in the pipelines. IMO is determined to progress on its major policy issues despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have rescheduled remote session of IMO meetings, which were postponed from the first half of this year. In this regard, I have been extremely impressed with the unprecedented level of cooperation and collaboration between IMO member states, also including industry, to support us in all our efforts. I would like to thank all IMO member states and relevant stakeholders for their continued support and cooperation in these unprecedented times. Ladies and gentlemen, despite these unprecedented circumstances, it is of utmost importance to not only do everything in our power to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on shipping, international trade and seafarers, but also to keep sight of the progress on our most important policy issues. Maritime transport is, is and will remain a vital global link in supporting sustainable international trade. I have spoken many times of our voyage together. Never has the speed of those words been more important than it is now. I can assure you that IMO, as the global regulator of international shipping, is ready to establish new partnerships of cooperation and sustainable economic recovery and to help drive the SDGs for the benefit of all humankind. Whatever else may happen, one thing is very certain. The more movement of raw materials energy and the transport of the manufacturer's goods and the products between continents would not be possible without maritime transport. And these are things on which sustainable recovery and the growth will depend. Sustainable shipping is vital for a sustainable planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for those inspiring words. It is now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel for today's forum. First, I'd like to introduce His Excellency, Mr. Robert Kortz, Minister for Aviation, Maritime and Security in the Department of, for Transport of the United Kingdom, a post to which he was appointed as Parliamentary Undersecretary of State earlier this month. He was previously Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Secretary of State of Transport and has also served on the International Trade Select Committee before becoming a minister. 
Before his election to Parliament, Mr. Quartz was a barrister. Our next panelist is His Excellency Mr. Ricardo Serrao Santos, Minister of Maritime Affairs from Portugal. Dr. Santos is a doctor in biology and animal ecology, and he was the director of the Department of Oceanography and Fisheries of the University of the Azores. He was also a member of the European Parliament between 2014 and 2019. Dr. Serrao Santos has been dedicated to the study of marine biodiversity and ocean ecosystems with hundreds of published works. He has chaired several scientific organizations of the European Union, Portugal, and the Azores. He holds positions in several scientific advisory bodies and committees. Next is Dr. Jawad Majur, who is the Assistant Director General of the Emergency Preparedness Division within the World Health Organization's Emergency Program, a position he has held since 2019. Dr. Majur is a public health specialist with over 30 years of experience in designing, implementing, and evaluating disease control programs at national and international levels. He has been with the World Health Organization since 2005. Prior to that, Dr. Majur was the Director of Epidemiology and Disease Control in the Ministry of Health of Morocco. Next is Mr. Alistair Fischbacher, President-Elect and Trustee at the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology, or IMRS. He's also the co-chair of the Sustainable Shipping Initiative. Previously, he was the general manager at Rio Tinto Marine, responsible for the construction and operation of a fleet of 17 large and very large bulk and specialist ships, as well as being responsible for sustainable development. He started his career at sea as a deck cadet and has worked in shipping and the mineral resources industries in a number of roles. Finally, Ms. Birgit Marie Leoden, who is the founder and CEO of the Ocean Opportunity Lab. She has been a change agent for the next generation in sustainable leadership in the maritime industry for 15 years. Through these years, she has been a sustainability and oceans industry director of the Oslo Business Region, director of North Shipping, founder and secretary general of Young Ship International, and project manager uh, for global systems and processes with Wilhelmsen. She's also a very active uh, partner and participant with IMO's great partner, WISTA. And with that, I would like to get into uh, our session. We have a number of questions uh, for our distinguished panel. Uh, I will ask the first question now uh, and ask each speaker to make an intervention of approximately three minutes. No more, please. Uh, we, we are going to be a little tight on time to get through this. And the first question is, what would be your key message to industry stakeholders with respect to a more, more sustainable shipping in the future? And has the pandemic changed the way you would have answered this question a year ago? And I'll turn the floor over to Minister Quartz, uh, who's representing our host nation here at IMO, the United Kingdom, for your response. Minister Quartz. Mr. Kenny, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm honoured to be here uh, to represent um, the United Kingdom's Department of Transport uh, today. Thank you very much um, for the warm welcome. Uh, it is a great honour to be a part of this distinguished panel today. My key message to industry would be one of encouragement. Um, climate change is one of the greatest challenges we face in the world today, and it does pose an urgent threat to our planet. But it is one that it is within our ability to address. It's up to all of us uh, to play our part in the transition to a cleaner future. And that includes shipping, which is responsible for around two to three percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. I'd like to welcome the good work on sustainability that we've seen from across the maritime transport industry to address this issue. We're increasingly seeing pledges to move towards net zero targets and commitments to increased energy efficiency, which set a great example of what we should be aiming for, not just within the shipping industry, but also beyond across all sectors of the economy. I would say, let's keep going. 
let's keep being ambitious and let's stay committed to what needs to be done. But clearly, the pandemic has obviously created an unprecedented situation for all of us. The maritime sector has been impacted by in a range of different ways, and it presents us with another major global challenge alongside and connected with climate change. Well, the UK has long been committed to ambitious climate action and sustainable shipping specifically, with the publication last year of our Clean Maritime Plan and our focus on delivering solutions globally under the initial IMO strategy. The pandemic has not changed this. If anything, it has only become clearer through calls from both industry and civil society that we need to step up on protecting our environment as we recover economically. So to add to what I've just said, my message would be let's keep going, but let's take this opportunity to go further, faster, together, so that we can ensure a clean, safe, sustainable future for shipping. Thank you very much, Minister Quartz. I'll now turn the floor over to Minister Sarau for your comments and introduction. Minister, I think your microphone may be muted. Okay, now it's okay? Okay. Yes, I'll we say, can hear you just fine. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Special greeting now to uh, the Secretary General of IMO and thank you for his uh, introduction. And now for uh, my Minister of Records from the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, to all the, the panelists, uh, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, greeting to you. Uh, sustainable shipping is not the question of being uh, politically correct or being uh, different anymore. It is a matter of need. Um, and the healthy oceans are a precondition for a healthy ocean of economy. OECD has been, uh, has been putting this forward and analyzing and publishing a lot on this field. And as it is known, shipping industry was much, wasn't much taken at the Paris Agreement and the ocean itself. However, IMO assumed a very good role establishing ambitious goals for the industry. Nevertheless, much more needs to be done. Uh, and we can follow the examples of success and the efforts through IMO regulations on um, uh, control of spills at sea and the control of ballast water. Uh, we have improved along the years, of course, with IMO uh, regulations. The biggest challenge uh, shipping industry is facing to become more sustainable is technology. The ones that lead the technology innovation will be the ones also leading the market, and we have to promote this. Finally, I believe the pandemic situation we are all facing did change the vision we should have for shipping industry. On the contrary, it enhanced the importance of sustainability and maintaining a healthy ocean, using us to dedicate even more and to improve. The pandemic has eventually delayed our plans, but it doesn't stop and should not stop us. Please allow me uh, uh, the following analogy to conclude. The situation has proven that we can only give a step forward when the strong financial investment is done, either from the private sector or the government or the connection between both. To be more specific, in the case of COVID-19, the goal is to achieve a vaccine. In the case of shipping, it is about becoming more sustainable, but at the end, both are a matter of human health and saving lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Majur, and I recognize that you may not be an expert in shipping, but at getting the World Health Organization's perspective on the issues writ large and, and how we will continue growing the, the economy in a sustainable fashion uh, in the wake of this pandemic uh, would be very valuable. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, thank you for, for uh, this opportunity and thank you for giving me the floor. General Secretary of IMO, Excellencies, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It is my pleasure, of course, to be with you and to be part of this distinguished panel to discuss this very important uh, uh, subject. 
this year, the anniversary of the International Maritime Days carries a special significance as it is taking place, du place during and precedented health crisis. And as mentioned by Mr. Kitak, the maritime, the maritime sectors has been facing ma major challenges by, posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, while continuing to play an important and crucial role to ensure the delivery of vital medical supply, food, and another essential goods that are critical for the COVID-19 response and recovery. Thank you for that. We are grateful for the commitment and sacrifice of the seafarer to ensure the sustainability of the supply chain during this pandemic. Health is a shared responsibility requiring whole of government and whole of society approach, including your sector, of course. Health, economy and social stability are all interlinked. You cannot have one which are with, without the other. COVID-19 had tested national health system as well as uncovered and amplified pre-existing gaps that has been highlighted by outbreaks and epidemic over the past decade. The international health regulation offers an, an international platform for better country and global preparedness, particularly related to international travel and port, airport transport and ground crossing. WHO has been calling for shared responsibility and global unity and solidarity to tackle the health and socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. Every individual, every sector has a role to play, including the maritime transport. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Mr. Fischbacher for your uh, opening statement. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, taking the second point in the question first, has the pandemic changed the way I would have answered this question a year ago? The answer is no, not really. The pandemic has certainly changed things and it's highlighted and raised issues of and for the shipping industry. But so far, I don't think it has an effect on progress towards or the achievability of a sustainable shipping industry. As time passes and we come to understand better how we have to adapt adapt to the pandemic, there may be some impact. It is notable that supply chains, which have kept almost the full range of good fl goods flowing and integral those, to those supply chains, are the ships which have continued to traverse the globe, made possible largely due to the understanding and patience of crews, many of whom have had considerably extended voyage times and hardship. It has also started to focus attention on these problems and others which need to be solved for both continued operation in these difficult times and for a sustainable shipping industry. I would hope that the impacts of this pandemic will only improve the drive for development and improvement that is truly on the path of a sustainable future. Sustainability covers a range of areas and is not limited to say emissions, which is perhaps most widely thought of, and perhaps there is current pro focus and progress in that area. It is becoming clear that the one size fits all of fuel oil is going to be replaced in the short to medium term at least with different fuels in different trades and locations. We already have LNG powered vessels, biofuels, and now Lloyd's Register just given approval in principle for an ammonia powered tanker design. But change is being driven by timetables and moving to a spread of fuels over a short period is going to pose challenges in infrastructure provision and incentivization. If we are not careful, we will suddenly see new era ships available without the necessary support to enable trading and without the skilled personnel to man them. The relationship between shipping, ports, associated industries and communities is going to be tested and will need work. It is therefore necessary to keep looking ahead across the spectrum of sustainability for shipping, which is articulated, for example, in the Sustainable Shipping Initiatives vision, which has six areas that need to be monitored and progressed and are tracked through its roadmap. In this competitive world, it's often easier to follow than to lead. If we wait for others to take risks, we do not progress as fast as we could. Collaboration can also reduce risk as by sharing of information, we can avoid following each other down a dead end. While organisations need to maintain confidentiality and commercial advantage, it is difficult for many to justify investment in new and untried technologies or certainly to repeat it if the first time failed. Collaboration at senior, management and technical operational levels can share those risks. 
organisations such as Imarest with its special interest groups, the Sustainable Shipping Initiative and the Global Maritime Forum with their working groups aim to facilitate group learning and action. Finally, we need to ensure that the talking leads to action. There are individual and group actions and developments, but it needs scaling up and adopting by the majority. At present, there is too much of a wait and see mode and what is needed is for more to join in to getting things done. But it must be in an increasingly coordinated fashion with national and international encouragement and support. The first step for many, though, is to actually join one of the groups who are doing something rather than waiting to see the output. Get involved, get working and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, excellent response. And I will now give the floor to Ms. Leoden for your views on the questions presented. The floor is yours. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, really interesting perspectives from all the panelists so far. I think for me, the answer is quite given. I've been pushing sustainability for the past 15 years as my core ambition to change the industry from within. So my my view uh, and my answer to this question has definitely not changed over the past year. But I do have an important key message on behalf of the young generation, because I think that we are still working too slow. And I think we need to, in, in, a, in a better way, bring the next generation of technology and mindsets and, and way of working to the table here as we are really running out of time. Um, um, I, th I think that when it comes to our industry, we have to have one very clear goal that we're all working for uh, ocean industries and a maritime industry that will be uh, free of emissions, free of waste. And we also need to conduct ocean industry allocation uh, in a way that regenerates resources rather than tapping them out of the system. Uh, and I would advise all the prominent people, both in, in this panel and around the world that are watching us now, to also read uh, the book on regenerative leadership by Laura Storm, which I think serves as a role model for all of us when it comes to rethinking the way that we build our society for the future. Um, from our side, working with the, with the young generation and the entrepreneurs, I do think that there are a lot of amazing opportunities in this crisis, uh, whether it is now the way of handling uh, the critical issues for the seafarers, um, um, which we, I think, were quite, uh, quite surprised to see how, how badly uh, the entire global uh, society is structured now. Uh, in a time like this, this is really kind of a red flag situation that we need to deal with much quicker. And again, I would think that bringing uh, newer mindsets also into this could cause different solutions and faster solutions. Um, I also do think that um, for us as an industry now, uh, we can't really wait. So I would send out the message to all of the ship owners out there and all the big players that if you are not adapting now, you will lose out of business because I think we already see it now. Cargo owners, they are going in and starting new shipping companies if we fail to act. So and, and we also see with the with the IMO and the regulatory um, bodies that if, if we are not really pushing, pushing the edges, we do see again and again that the other industries will do the push for us. So now we have the, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, IBC, coming with new regulations in the financial sector is pushing now for ESG investments. And of course, all the actors out there who want to continue to build profitable businesses for the future, they need to change quite a lot and there is nothing to wait for. This is happening now. So that would be my quite uh, clear message out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birgit. Uh, I think we got some really um, uh, a, a wide range of views, but also a very important range of views uh, uh, with respect to ensuring that, that shipping becomes and remains sustainable in the future. I'd like to turn to the next question now. 
Uh, and that is, what do you think the maritime community to, should do to ensure there is an appropriate number of duly skilled seafarers and fishers in the future? And how do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted those efforts? I'd like to first ask uh, Minister Quartz for your views on this question. Well, thank you. Uh, our success uh, above all else uh, relies on our workforce. Um, the importance of having a diverse, skilled and rewarded maritime workforce is vital. Within the next three decades, we want to create a workforce that is equipped with the right skills and is able to adapt to rapidly changing technology. To realise this vision, we must do more to enthuse young people about STEM subjects, which will be so vital for the maritime sector, as well as showing them the full breadth of opportunity that this sector has to offer. Maritime needs to expand its core base of talent and recognise that it's competing against other international sectors in transport and elsewhere that are more prominent in the public eye. These sectors are ahead of maritime in engaging and seeking talent from a diverse background. It needs to change its public persona, particularly for roles at sea, and show, showcase the huge breadth of jobs at all skill levels it offers and the rewards that these jobs can provide, both financially and personally. Training needs to meet the current and expected future needs of the industry. The conditions of employment and the work environment need to be attractive and flexible to maintain and broaden the appeal of the sector to the current and prospective workforce. Standards should continue to improve and new entrants should be able to see a clear career progression, whether that's through the ranks on board or moving from sea to land at a later stage of their career. Well, the pandemic has certainly raised the profile of shipping, but not always for better within the media. Regardless of the media presentation, the global community needs to address the welfare and repatriation issues for the welfare of our current seafarers. This is simple human necessity, and it is also crucial to all in order to restore the perception of the sector as a progressive and modern workplace. Thank you very much, Minister, for that very uh, complete response. Uh, Minister Sarah, your views uh, in particular, given that uh, the fishing industry is so important to the economy of Portugal, sir. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I keep forgetting about the sound. Um, uh, and thank you, Frederick. Uh, uh, the maritime and fishery in the industry have, in fact, undergone significant changes in their models of branding. Uh, therefore, it is expected that this change will continue to occur in a, in a, at a rapid pace. The, the changes were propelled not only by the mechanism of for economic reasoning, but also environmental, safety and security factors of growing importance. Year after year, uh, year after year, shipping exhibitions uh, exhibits a continuous growth. Shipping exhibits a continuous growth and taking into account the evolution of global trade and the rise of world's population, it is anticipated that increasingly demand of maritime transport due to the growing demand of supplies. Unfortunately, this growth has not been reflected in growing qualified human resources. And due to COVID-19 pandemic, the industry and main sector operators are expressing reduced future expectations at short or medium term, which will result in a significant decrease on qualified workforce supply. When discussing development Alongside the COVID-19 pandemic and possible future events, the attractiveness of marine maritime careers will tend to reduce significantly due to the increased uncertainty regarding boarding periods, impossibility for an embarked seafarer to disembark during their rest periods, reduction of the transport facility supply available for seafarers repatriation. It is noteworthy that international community, interest in countries on the shipping business and the economic and social sectors partners should assemble their supporters on the promotion of attractiveness of maritime careers, namely by increasing welfare, working conditions on board 
specialized professional training supply security, among others. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Ms. Leoden, I'd like to ask a variant of this question to you. What would be the key challenges for greater diversity, inclusion, and equality on board and ashore in the next five to 10 years? Thank you. I, I think this is two key elements that we need to look at here. First of all, uh, we have a very outdated way of thinking about a maritime career. So what we need to work towards in the future it is much more um, a lifespan approach, but where you can mix your, your time on board and on shore to a much, uh, much different extent because the roles on board the ships will be different, but also if we want to recruit a more diverse um, uh, crew and, and people in our industry, we need to rethink the models that we have. Our society today was built as kind of the industrial society with a very kind of, uh, with a very big split of roles between home uh, in the office. And we have made all of these silos in our society that boxes people out. I think now is really a, a good time that we have also seen now during COVID to rethink how are we building our organizations for people to thrive, to be able to create somewhat of a, a work family fusion. I think that for, in order to, to really be uh, more attractive both for the younger generation and for a broader group of, of, of the best talents and the best brains to come into our industry, we need to open up because they will want they will have different values in place. They will want to have different expectations as how they are spending the hours in their lives. So I think we just need to rethink a little bit and then look for the new opportunities of both um, addressing how it is actually, as, well, as I see it, if you want to work um, with the biggest problems that we need to solve in society today. There is no better place than doing that in the maritime industries and you can truly make an impact and it goes like across all countries, regions, etc. Um, but I also I really need that we need we I really think that we need a complete change of image and mindset from within the industry. Uh, we need an industry that more people actually feel committed and engaged by. And I do think I sailed with a Grimaldi ship uh, across the Mediterranean to Israel this spring uh, with an amazing crew. And I also talked with them about, you know, their every day. And especially now when they have been, when people have been stuck on board the ships uh, for months, you see that the, the critical issues that we already weren't dealing with when it comes to isolation, mental health, uh, how you thrive as a person, they were already there before the pandemic. And we need to fix them now if we are to believe that we will be a more uh, engaging and attractive industry, because these are kind of basic issues that we are talking about here, that every normal person would like to have better uh, access to time with the people that they love. So, uh, and, and of course, we want people to stay in our industry for like all through their lives. And then we also have to open up to think that you can go between uh, a land-based job, you can explore periods where you're, where you're sailing or you're working offshore, but, but we need to just open up because it also gives us a lot more of interaction uh, in a span that can create more innovation in our industry that we need as well. But so, yeah, rethink and just a more human approach. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now open the floor to all the panelists. Do, do any of you have any comments on the interventions that have just been made? You can just wave your hand. I can see you all. So, um, uh, and I'll give you the floor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Joe. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity and I, I would like just to insist on the uh, issue of cooperation and also not to define the, uh, or to restrict the definition of health to only the absence of disease. The WHO constitution defined health and I will quote 
as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not uh, merely the absence of disease or, of, or infirmity. And this is what our uh, interlocutor was saying, that we need to be innovative in our approach to, to health. Uh, of course, health is a shared responsibility, uh, uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's paramount, as was said before me, to reinforce cooperation and coordination at the international level. And here I would like to thank the IMO for their strong collaboration with WHO and other partners during this crisis, but also at national level and more importantly at local and in the professional uh, level. Uh, I think personally that cooperation is essential between health, health sectors and other sectors, especially the sector related to travel and trade uh, port and, and in, uh, at port and airport. The competent authorities and the respective mandate should come together and they should create an environment free for, from public health risk for the seafarers. And this is extremely important uh, because of their great role, not only uh, supplying the world, but also keeping communication uh, with, uh, within the world. Uh, of course, again, the international tribulation uh, uh, countries are are required to develop capacities in, in the in the point of entry, including port. And this is uh, 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 something that uh, the two sectors can work together: the health sector and the transport sector. Uh, also, from an occupational health point of view, access to the medical care and healthcare services are uh, critical to ensure good physical and mental health of the professional. Uh, professionals working in, in the maritime sector. Uh, of course, in the beginning of this pandemic, many countries have implemented restriction uh, of international uh, traffic, including flight suspension and port closure. And this, of course, had a significant impact on international shipping and also in seafarer uh, needs, for, uh, not only for uh, work, but also for health and uh, uh, Mrs. Lyudin mentioned uh, the, the situation where uh, passengers and seafarers were stuck in, 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 uh, in cruise ships for many months and uh, uh, deprived from uh, access to uh, essential care services. Of course, uh, the priority in resuming international travel should be given to essential uh, travel uh, to uh, to resume, and among which we think in W should that ceasefire, cease, sorry, ceasefire should be considered critical personnel for essential travel, and be given the opportunity to uh, assume and, and 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 do their work. Of course, W H O is continuing to work with the countries and health authorities to keep essential supply chain fully functional when they implement the health mitigation measures, and also to identify the ceasefire as the key workers when prioritizing health travel during the course of the reopening borders. I think the key word from our side is a strong collaboration and cooperation between the health sector and the maritime sector in general. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monsieur. Mr. Fishbacker, I saw that you wanted to come in. <clears throat> Thank you. Just a couple of uh, uh, quick points. I think uh, I agree with uh, um, you know, the comments that have been made before around the education and the attractiveness of the industry. Uh, there is a question also uh, mentioned by Begit about the uh, diversity issues and having the right uh, training and education and expectations. This is a changing industry. This is things are happening very differently. But at the same time, there is still and there will be for some while to come the need for basic maritime skills as well. The, the traditional seafarer as such, the skills for the traditional seafarer are not going to be uh, not needed overnight. We are going to need to maintain those. Uh, and until we get to the stage of perhaps unmanned vessels uh, dominantly trading uh, the seas, uh, I think you know, we've got some balancing acts to do between uh, yeah, the basic almost manual labour that exists on ships at the moment, uh, coupled with the expectations of a high technical uh, and computational uh, abilities uh, for the seafarers of the future. Um, and how do we work that back into the education system uh, and perhaps even further into uh, you know, 
the differentials between rural and urban areas and the accessibility of the right sort of uh, resources and the education standards that are needed to ensure that there is a broad and diverse uh, opportunity uh, for people to come into the industry. And particularly, as, as was said very early on, the, this industry needs to be attractive. It only seems to gather bad press uh, if, we, if we take the, uh, yeah, the, the recent uh, epi pan the pandemic now, uh, the headlines in the paper, the cruise ship spreads COVID around the world, is yeah, completely unhelpful. Um, and uh, there, there never seems to be good news about shipping, there only seems to be bad news. And that's a big obstacle to overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, and I, I see that we're starting to get, oh, Brid Bergen, did you want to come back in? Please go ahead. Well, well, just very briefly on, on your last point there, uh, Mr. Fischbacher. Um, of course, yeah, there is a lot of bad press about shipping. And, and I remember way back before I started, I wouldn't even want to be in shipping before I started because of the, the bad image. But I also think that's up to us to change it because I would say that, OK, for now, we are defined in the outside world as kind of Scrooge and in a lot of negative ways still, but it is changing. And now we have, I mean, we have an amazing opportunity now to redefine what, what can and will shipping and the maritime industry help when it comes to resolving issues for the global societies and with a lot more urbanization around the world, because you will need to have more floating resources uh, all over the world. We, we can be the ones that transport clean energy, that produces clean energy, and that tackles a lot of varying needs and, and critical bottlenecks for the societies around the world. But it, it, is, it, it is up to us to both communicate that message that we want to be the problem solvers for the society, bringing the next generation of Greta Thunberg people on board and basically kind of convert young climate activists over to business activists that I would like to see much more of and getting them on board and join the movement of changing this industry from within. But then we also have to set we have to set a lighthouse or like where are we going? And I think going towards saying that we are going towards a uh, a non-polluting industry, a zero emission industry that also tackles, that don't impact the world in a bad way. That is a very good uh, path ahead and that is a message that will get the next generation on board. But it has to be truthful, it has to be genuine and we need to do it now. Thank you very much, Birgit. And I think that is an excellent segue into our next question. But before I get to that, uh, I see that we're getting a, some good questions in the chat. I'd encourage you to ask them. We will have uh, time for the Q&A session at the end. So uh, for those of you in the audience and uh, I'm told we have a very large audience today, uh, I'd encourage you to ask your questions so that we can uh, get the views of the panelists on them. Uh, the next question is, uh, the initial IMO GHG strategy includes a vision to ultimately phase out greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping completely. And I think some of the panelists have already touched on this. How can we combine this ambitious goal with the sustainable growth of developing countries and their position in the global economy? I'll ask Mr. Fischbacher for your previews first. Thank you. <clears throat> the issue of a level playing field is one that's been with us since mechanisms for reducing emissions started being debated. Uh, there is a need to ensure that truly, in, uh, <clears throat> truly dependent economies are not disproportionately affected. But at the same time, we recognise that zeroing emissions does have a cost that must be shared. The key is perhaps in the phrase phasing out. We must start if we hope to achieve the goal and we will need to develop limited temporary exemptions or reliefs along the way to spread, mitigate or delay the impact of the overall programme. The nature of international shipping with flag ownership and trades, not necessarily or perhaps not often coinciding in the same state, makes the question of qualification for such treatment tricky, as there is the potential for a colander effect where everyone finds a hole that fits them and they all trickle out of the system. Limited delays to reductions in some areas will have an impact, 
but not as much as not moving forward generally. This is a, a big problem that we have to find a solution to. And uh, as we speak now, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I, I wish I did. But there is, uh, it's, a measure, it's a combination of political and economic uh, and aspirational uh, factors which needs to be merged uh, for the greater good of uh, the planet as a whole and the shipping industry, of course, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now open it up to the other panelists uh, who might have views on this uh, on this question, this very important question. Uh, Minister Quartz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Well, you're absolutely right. This is a very important question. Um, you know, as we know, climate change is one of the biggest threats to the sustainable growth uh, of developing countries, uh, and it's our shared duty. We've got to be ambitious um, and decarbonise the sector as soon as possible um, in line with the initial strategy. Um, we're conscious, however, uh, that a vast number of developing countries are also highly dependent on shipping um, for the well functioning of their economies uh, and that the socioeconomic impacts of COVID have hit these countries the hardest. So it's crucial uh, that the transition to clean shipping in the context of a global COVID recovery is a just transition. Uh, now, I mean, what I mean by that is one where there are clear opportunities uh, for sustainable growth. Uh, developing countries are extremely important actors in international shipping. They represent the world's biggest maritime flags and 15 out of the world's 20 largest ports. Um, the potential for investment in clean maritime in these countries is therefore a very significant one. Um, for example, an increasing number of studies now show that there's a great opportunity for these countries in the production of maritime's future fuels. Um, if you look at the study uh, conducted by EDF, for example, the introduction of electrofuels in Chile uh, could unlock investment worth up to 90 billion US dollars for the country. Um, so as stated by the initial strategy, um, the IMO collectively must consider the impacts of potential policy measures on states, um, especially developing countries, um, least developed countries and small island developing states um, before adopting them. Now for the UK's position, and we are committed to ensuring that that's the case um, by remaining an ambitious and evidence-based voice at negotiations and to work, of course, collaboratively with our peers to ensure that the specific and emerging needs of developing countries are met. Thank you very much, sir. Any of the other panelists, would you like to come in? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, please, go ahead. We don't see you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you know, as it is uh, well known, international shipping account for around 70% uh, of global emissions of CO2 and uh, also 10% of the transport emission. But it could be responsible, as it is calculated, for 70% of global CO2 emissions in 2050 if left unregulated. So we need ambitious and concrete, uh, uh, concrete po uh, policies to meet the goals set forth by the IMO to reach that uh, carbon neutrality in the second half of the century. The initial strategy is the first milestone set out in the roadmap for developing a comprehensive IMO strategy on the reduction of GH, GHG emission from ships. The carbonization is not often a priority for less developed countries compared to economic growth and poverty alleviation. Many of these countries struggle with gaps in technical and financial expertise, a lack of resources and uh, poor governance. Developing countries need to implement policies that shift the economy away from the carbon intensive industries. G this should be coordinated at a global level to ensure a worldwide shift towards an equitable, equitable and environmentally responsible future. Portugal as an effective member of the IMO approved the strategy and is in line with its conventions and resolution. One of the Portugal priorities has been the carbonization of maritime transport through the promotion of green sh shipping as well liquefied natural gas, a low carbon fuel, mostly methane, without neglecting the exploration of alternatives such as new falls and zero emissions technologies. We believe that the sustainable growth of developing countries in face of the ambition goal of a phased 
out greenhouse emissions from international shipping, completed set out in the initial IMO GHG strategy, can be achieved through stimulus package to revitalize the shipping industry. It is an opportunity to accelerate its green transition, provided that the incentives are granted only to operators that prove they are making efforts to scale up the adoption of low carbon technologies and fuels, together with the development of further actions on capacity building, technical cooperation, research and development, and creating lowest emissions of renewable energy strategies to each country's unique circumstance. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, are there any more interventions? I don't see any hand. Okay, Birgit. Um, I, if I could just ask you to be brief, I want to get to one more question before we go to the Q&A. Thank you. I will be very brief. I just wanted to comment that I think that if we want to create uh, sustainable growth for developing countries, you you really have to build that on sustainable business and the green shift. This is where the money is going to come in. We have to stop looking at the green uh, initiatives as a cost and we have to look at it as the best investment case and the best opportunities moving forward. And this is something that BlackRock and the big institutional investors have started realizing. So I think this is only uh, actually a good opportunity for the developing countries to pick up speed compared to the old established world. Thank you very much. And I'll now get to the, the final question that we'll, uh, we'll address today. Uh, and that is Marpole Annex 5 prohibits the discharge of materials containing plastics into the ocean since the 1980s. Notwithstanding this convention, studies have shown that marine plastic litter does still originate from shipping and fishing related sources. What can the industry do to ensure that we close the loop on this issue for the future? Uh, Minister Sarau, I'd like you, if we could get your views on that matter, please. Thank you. Nope, your microphone's off. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, and thank you. Uh, littering, despite legal regulation and law enforcement mechanism, is still a highly damaging reality, both from land, but also sea-based economical activities. And uh, most of the litter uh, that we see at sea comes from there. Responsible waste management uh, represents a cost for business and a very high one in the case of sea-based activities, as ship must transport the waste of waste generated on board. Furthermore, in the fishing industry, it may compete with the limited space available on board for fish storage, ju just reducing the amount of factual fisheries activity. Storage space on board will always be very valuable. And to tackle the problem of illegal littering to the sea, we need new approaches and mechanisms which go well beyond regulation and we need the industry to take part in the transition. We urgently need to adopt measures within this circular economy paradigm specifically designated to sea-based industries. That is, we must concentrate our efforts on a systematic approach involving all the relevant structures and stakeholders and device solutions that either reduce the input, reuse or add new value to the waste generated on board. As for the fishing industry, we have seen very positive progress being made recently at the European level on the development of recommendations for the design of more sustainable fishing gear. And I believe we will see positive change happening soon. The change is, of course, being driven by the new single use plastic and fishing gear directive, which will come into force next year. The extent producer mechanism related to the fishing gear waste Management is mobilizing the industry and I believe will bring out effective solutions which will help close the loop and reduce the loss of fishing gear to the sea, which is actually a big problem. We also need innovation for more efficient onboard waste management. And there are positive solutions already developed. We need to encourage and support these mainstreaming. I said, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, does any of the other panelists have a brief intervention? Uh, Minister Quartz. 
I'd just like to make a quick uh, few points on this, because this is something that really matters to the UK government. Uh, obviously, marine pollution is an international problem, but stopping it at source is key. So we'll have to work with all stakeholders, regulators to educators, uh, to port companies. Everyone's got their role to play. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to make briefly. I mean, there's one solution about making regulations for managing plastics on board ships simpler and easier to follow, um, easier for everyone to comply then. Uh, secondly, I think the education point is paramount, um, training workers to identify opportunities uh, to minimise waste and promote um, efficiency. Uh, and thirdly, ensuring adequate port reception facilities will be really important in tackling the issue as well. We've got to make sure there's adequate shoreside facilities for quick ship uh, discharging. Um, and we're, this really matters to us. Really looking forward to working with everybody. Thank you, Birgit. I think, uh, since I'm not a politician, I will focus on the business part. <laughs> uh, firstly, reversed vending mechanisms, because if you get paid for your garbage, you won't throw it back. So that's very easy in, in a few words. Uh, and then the other part is, of course, as it was mentioned before, producers responsibility. So I think if we combine these things together, producers responsibility all through the product's lifespan and for that, for their wastes and the reversed wending where you actually get money back only when you deliver uh, the trash, the fishing nets or whatever you have on board. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, with that, I'd also like to mention that, of course, the, the IMO uh, in partnership with a number of other entities, including the Food and Agriculture Organization, is uh, is implementing the uh, the Global Litter Partnerships Project uh, to help reduce and prevent marine plastic litter. Uh, there is information on it on the IMO website, and I would uh, encourage you all to take a look at it. Uh, next, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll move to the Q and A session because I do want time for questions. We've received some very good questions. Uh, I do see we had one question on designating uh, crew as key workers that I think many of you have covered in your interventions. Uh, there was also a very nice note uh, congratulating all on World, World Maritime Day from uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Honduras. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, there was a question regarding the STCW convention that, sir, we'll get a written response to you on that because it is quite technical and we'll have our experts take a look at it. But the first question that I'd like to put to the panel comes from Dr. David Santillo from Green, Greenpeace Research Laboratories. And that is, what do the recent incidents involving the Waukesheel bulk carrier uh, off the coast of Mauritius and the new diamond tanker off the coast of Sri Lanka tell us about the true progress towards sustainable shipping in the real world? And is, it, and is a deeper and more honest reflection on the underlying causes and drivers of such incidents overdue. Um, I'll open that to the panel. Uh, Mr. Fishbacker, I think uh, probably I'd like to hear your views on this first from the, the technical and engineering standpoint. Thank you. Um, I mean, obviously these incidents are uh, uh, awful. Uh, and have had a, a significant uh, and uh, very visible impact. Um, how we move to uh, complete avoidance of them is uh, a, an enormous challenge um, because it takes just one incident like this to go around the globe, but uh, yeah, an accident involving a car and even uh, occasional aircraft accidents uh, fail to make the same sort of level of exposure or press. Uh, I don't think uh, that singular, singular incidents in themselves are indicators of uh, actual trends or uh, deficiencies. Uh, certainly there is an awful amount of learning and understanding that needs to come out of them and uh, investigations do take place uh, and uh, Things are learned from it and changes will be made where, uh, where possible. Um, at the end of the day, uh, humans are still involved in these processes and humans for one reason or another uh, either make mistakes or take actions which are uh, you know, incorrect. Um, and shipping is one of those 
uh, industries, which is remote. It is, although we've got increased telemetry and we have increased interaction, which we didn't have, say, even 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, yeah, it is not an entirely assured controlled industry. The decisions and the actions are taking place locally uh, and we are then reviewing those uh, with the benefit of hindsight and with uh, often only part of the information uh, available to us. So I don't see these incidents as being uh, indicators of a failure to uh, be progressing towards a sustainable industry. Uh, I see them as uh, unfortunate and uh, you know, to be avoided in the future uh, wherever possible. But uh, yeah, the progress towards sustainability for an industry is much bigger and much broader than that. And yeah, if we can get to zero accidents, uh, zero incidents, we will certainly have achieved something uh, really significant, particularly in a broad and diverse an industry as, as shipping is. Thank you very much. Do any of the other panelists want to come in? Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, just a, a short word. Yes, uh, these are very unfortunate um, incidents and they should be taken very seriously and investigation should be very serious. But I hope that they are the exception that confirm the rule that the things have improved. A lot. If you go to the beach now, the crude oil in the beach uh, almost disappear. When I was young, it was a, it's a, a terrible, a terrible thing. Uh, but we have to improve uh, through um, more control, uh, more regulations, and uh, we have something uh, similar with the, uh, in in fisheries. That's IUU fisheries. IUU fisheries, despite all the regulations, all the um, uh, regional organizations for the management of of, of the of the fisheries and uh, all the good things that in fact we also reached because we were able to reduce uh, to to uh, revive some uh, but uh, IUU fisheries is still um, a nightmare in the oceans uh, it's difficult to to tackle it's a big fight that we have to take in the end because it's even uh, taken out uh, the, 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 the economy in, 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 in developing countries and the, the, the income of, uh, of uh, small developing island states and, uh, and developing states. So this is two things that we still, we, we make big improvements, but we have to improve more, more and more. They are, I hope these are exceptions, but they existed and they are very worrying accidents, of course. Thank you. Thank you. On a, on a somewhat related matter, uh, I have a question for Minister Quartz uh, from the uh, from the audience, and I, it's a pretty challenging question, but is what is your opinion about the intention of the European Commission and the European Parliament to unilaterally, unilaterally introduce shipping into the European emissions trading system, despite the work that IMO is conducting? I, I think you muted, sir. Thank you. I think you're okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, the, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, well, look, shipping it continues to be uh, an international issue. Um, you know, that's firmly our view, and we also think that that solution is one that will have to come about internationally in cooperation with uh, international partners. Thank you, sir. Um, I have another question here, and I think, uh, Mr. Fishbacker, this might be uh, the best suited for you. Um, many thanks for this very interesting panel. I would like to ask about cold ironing developments and incentives in Europe. Um, Leading container shipping lines have vessels equipped to be connected to shore electricity, but the port authorities are not ready yet. What can be done? <clears throat> That's a, a good point, and I, I think it, it comes back to the point I made in my introduction uh, about the need for the shore facilities to keep up with the developments on the ships. 
um, or, or the uh, types of uh, ship facilities. Um, and cold ironing is something that's come in in uh, certain areas quicker than in others. Uh, and of course, as a result of that, you will have ships that can arrive at ports with the facilities for cold ironing, but the ports themselves have not yet implemented the infrastructure necessary to provide what is a considerable amount of power uh, uh, from the shore side uh, uh, to the ship, uh, often on berths which are fairly remote uh, and require therefore uh, large scale power infrastructure uh, being brought into the port and then through to the berth. So it's a work in progress. Uh, what incentives could be given to it? Uh, it's the incentives need to come through the port because it, it's the community that's going to benefit uh, from the reduced emissions in port. Uh, yeah, there is, uh, you can't be sort of then putting the onus on the ship owner to somehow make the port have it. it, 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 it that's the, uh, the wrong way around. It, need, it needs to be uh, a joint effort in, in some respects. Thank you very much. Birgit, would you like to come in? I do, because I, I do know I'm, uh, that there is a huge issue with the constraints on the grids in many countries and especially like small or rural areas. And this is where I actually have to think that we also we, we don't have to look at just the existing grid and land based energy. This is an amazing opportunity for the maritime industry uh, producing uh, floating installations and floating power banks. This, I mean, this is one of the many opportunities for the maritime industry uh, combined with offshore um, and energy uh, actors to actually now rethink again uh, how we produce energy. I mean, the ocean is full of energy. You have wind, floating solar, and you have, of course, the untapped potential of the energy in, in the seas and the waves. So I think here are a lot of amazing opportunities looking ahead for more flexible access to clean energy and um, docking uh, the ships when they need it, regardless of the local grid and without uh, putting uh, local communities fully in the darkness while we charge the ships. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've received uh, a number of additional questions, but we've reached the end of this webinar. Thank you for the, all those who uh, asked questions. A number of the questions that we received related to seafarers and the current crew change crisis, uh, which we were only able to touch upon briefly in this webinar. However, uh, later today at one o'clock London time, uh, the United Nations will be holding a special high level event uh, specifically directed at the crew change crisis. Uh, it is a very high level event. There will be a statement from UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres. There will also be statements from our Secretary General, Mr. Kitak Lim, the Director General of the ILO, Guy Ryder. Uh, there are five different ministers from around the globe who will be participating. Uh, and mo uh, there will be industry, representatives of major corporations who utilize the shipping industry to get their views on the crew change crisis. And most importantly, you will be able to hear from some actual seafarers who have been through uh, and endured the inability to change out and have been stranded on uh, their vessels. This is, it promises to be a very exciting uh, uh, webinar and very interesting. We're gonna be putting up uh, the link to it if you would like to uh, listen in in uh, just an, an hour or so uh, and I would commend it to you. It should be very good. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists for all of your uh, views expressed. This was really an excellent panel and um, you you really uh, put together some great views and uh, put them out to the audience and uh, I thank you very much for your participation. Just to sum up, Shipping is the backbone of global trade, and while its sustainability and growth will greatly depend on trade, shipping is also a driver for the global economic recovery. The maritime community can direct, directly contribute to its own rapid recovery, such as the global recovery, by addressing its challenges, which have been highlighted by this pandemic, particularly issues concerning seafarers 
the need for uh, increased utilization of digital technology, the need for alternative fuels and technologies, and the need to address diversity within the industry. Moving towards a more sustainable shipping industry will be a key to building back a better resilient global economy through decarbonization, energy transition, and digitalization. In addition, seafarers will need to be put more in focus of our policies and practices as we all strategically address the future of the industry from a human point of view. With that, we will close the session. Thank you all for your participation and enjoy the remainder of World Maritime Day. Thank you very much.